The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 17 Five days after John Holbrook's departure, Judith fell ill. Her mother, inclined at first to attribute her complaints to moping, took a second look at her flushed cheeks and put her to bed. Within two more days, alarm had spread to every corner of Wethersfield. Sixteen children and young people were stricken with the mysterious fever, and none of the family remedies seemed to be of any benefit. For days, Judith tossed on the cot they had spread for her in front of the hearth, burning with fever, fretful with pain, and often too delirious to recognize the three women who hovered about her. A young surgeon was summoned from Hartford to bleed her, and a nauseous brew of ground-roasted toads was forced between her cracked lips to no avail. The fever simply had to run its course. On the fourth day, Kit felt chilly and lightheaded, and by twilight, she was thankful to sink down on the mat they dragged to the fireside near her cousin. Her bout with the malady was short, however. Her wiry young body, nourished by Barbados fruit and sunshine, had an elastic vitality, and she was back on her feet while Judith was still barely sitting up to sip her gruel. Dressing rather shakily, Kit was compelled to ask Mercy's assistance with the buttons down her back and was shocked when her older cousin suddenly bent double in a violent fit of coughing. Kit whirled around on her. How long have you been coughing like that, she demanded. Let me feel your hand. Aunt Rachel, for heaven's sake, get Mercy to bed quick. Here she's trying to wait on us. Tears of weakness and protest ran down Mercy's cheeks as Rachel stooped to take off her oldest daughter's shoes. Kit heated the warming pan to take the chill off Mercy's bed in the corner, and Mercy buried her face in the pillows as though it were a shame past bearing that she should cause so much trouble. Mercy was seriously ill. Twice, the young doctor rode out from Hartford to bleed her. The third time, He stood looking soberly down at her. I dare not bleed her further, he said helplessly. Rachel raised timid eyes to her husband. Matthew, do you think that perhaps Gershom Bulkley might know something to help her? He is skilled. Matthew's lips tightened. I have said that man does not come into my house, he reminded her. We will hear no more about it. Rachel, already worn from the long vigil with Judith, was near the breaking point. Matthew, after working in the fields all day, forced his wife against her will to get some rest while he sat by his daughter's bedside at night. Judith watched helplessly, still too weak to even comb her own hair. The meals fell to Kit, and she did the best she could with them, measuring out the cornmeal, stirring up the pudding, spooning it into a bag to boil, and cursing the clumsiness that she had never taken the pains to overcome. She built up the fire, heated kettles of water for the washing, so that Mercy might have fresh linen under her restless body. She fetched water and strained a special gruel for Judith, and spread her uncle's wet clothes to dry before the fire. At night, she dozed off, exhausted, and woke with a start, sure that something was left undone. Mercy lay on some remote borderland between sleeping and waking. Nothing could rouse her, and every breath was such a painful struggle that the slow rasp of it filled the whole house. Fear seeped in at the corners of the room. The family dared not speak above a whisper, though certainly Mercy was beyond hearing. On the fourth morning of Mercy's illness, Matthew did not go to work at all, but sat heavily at the table, turning the pages of the Bible, searching in vain for some hope to cling to, or shut himself in the company room where they heard his heavy tread back and forth, back and forth, the length of the room. 
Toward noontime, he took down his coat from the peg. I'm going out for a time, he said hoarsely. He had one sleeve in the coat when a knock sounded on the door, and as he drew back the bolt, a man's voice grated harshly through the silent room. Let me in, man. I've something to say. Matthew Wood stepped back from the door, and the Reverend Bulkley loomed on the kitchen threshold. Matthew, he said, you're a stubborn mule and a rebel, but this is no time for politics. Time was your mercy was like my own daughter. Let me see her, Matthew. Let me do what I can with God's help to save her. Matthew's voice was almost a sob. Come in, Gershom, he choked. God bless you. I was coming to fetch you. Dr. Bulkley's solid presence brought to them all new hope. I have a theory, he told them. I've read something like it, and twill do no harm to try. Cook me some onions in a kettle. For four long hours, Kit labored at Dr. Bulkley's bidding. She sliced onions, blinking her eyes against the stinging tears. She kept the fire blazing under the iron kettle. When the onions were cooked to the right softness, Dr. Bulkley piled them in mass on a linen napkin and applied the blistering poultice to Mercy's chest. As soon as the poultice cooled, a new one must be ready. Late in the afternoon, the doctor rose to his feet. There are others I must tend to, he muttered. Keep her warm. I'll be back before midnight. Kit busied herself to prepare a meal which none of them could eat. With fingers so heavy from fatigue and fear that she could scarcely force them to move, she cleared the table and put away the untouched food. She wondered if ever again she would escape from the sound of that dreadful breathing. Her own lungs ached with every sighing breath that Mercy drew. Then, without warning, a new fear came rushing upon her. From without the house, there was an approaching sound of stamping feet and murmuring voices gathering volume in the roadway outside. There was a crashing knock on the outer door. The three women's eyes met in consternation. Matthew Wood reached the door in one stride and flung it open. How dare you, he demanded in a low-voiced anger. Know you not there is illness here? Aye, we know right enough, a voice replied. There's illness everywhere. We need your help to put a stop to it. What do you want? We want you to come along with us. We're going for the witch. Get away from my house at once, ordered Matthew. You'll listen to us first, shouted another voice. If you know what's good for your daughter. Keep your voices down then and be quick, warned Matthew. I have no time to listen to foolishness. Is it foolishness that there's scarce a house in this town but has a sick child in it? You'd do well to heed what we say, Matthew Wood. John Weatherall's boy died today. That makes three dead. And it's the witch's doing. Who's doing? What are you driving at, man? The Quaker woman's down by Blackbird Pond. She's been a curse on this town for years with her witchcraft. The voices sounded hysterical. We should have run her out long ago. Time and again, she's been seen consorting with the devil down in that meadow. Now she's put a curse on our children. God knows how many more will be dead before morning. This is nonsense, scoffed Matthew Wood impatiently. There's no old woman and no witchcraft either could bring on a plague like this. What is it then? shrilled a woman's voice. Matthew passed a hand over his forehead. The will of God, he began helplessly. The curse of God, you mean? another voice screamed. His judgment on us for harboring an infidel and a Quaker. You'd better come with us, Matthew. Your own daughters like to die. You can't deny it. I'll have not to do with it, said Matthew firmly. I'll hold with no witch hunt. You better hold with it, the woman's voice shrilled again. You'd better look to that witch in your own household. Ask that high and mighty niece of yours where she spends her time, 
another woman shouted from the darkness. Ask her what she knows about your mercy sickness. The weariness dropped suddenly from Matthew Wood. With his shoulders thrown back, he seemed to tower in the doorway. Be gone from my house, he roared, his caution drowned in anger. How dare you speak the name of a good, God-fearing girl? Any man who slanders one of my family has me to reckon with. There was silence. No harm meant, a man's voice said uneasily. "'Tis only woman's talk. "'If you won't come, there's plenty more in town who will,' said another. "'What are we wasting time for?' "'The voices receded down the pathway, "'rising again in the darkness beyond. "'Matthew bolted the door and turned back to the dumbfounded women. "'Did they wake her?' he asked dully. "'No,' said Rachel. "'Even that could not disturb her, poor child.' For a moment, there was no sound but that tortured breathing. Kit had risen to her feet and stood clinging to the table's edge. Now the new fear that was stifling her broke from her lips in an anguished whisper. What will they do to her? Her aunt looked up in alarm. Matthew's black brows drew together darkly. What concern is that of yours? I know her, she cried. She's just a poor, helpless old woman. Oh, please tell me, will they harm her? This is Connecticut, answered Matthew sternly. They will abide by the law. They will bring her to trial, I suppose. If she can prove herself innocent, she is safe enough. But what will they do to her now, tonight, before the trial? How do I know? Leave off your questions, girl. Is there not trouble enough in our own house tonight? He lowered himself into a chair and sunk his head into his hands. And I think we'll stop here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. Bye-bye.